Hello, misfits, and welcome back to the world of Aurelia. You are listening to episode 8 of the current campaign. Unfortunately, I only have my audio from our last game, so the recording is going to be a bit different than you're used to. I'm so sorry about that, and I will do my best to sort of cover everything. I hope you enjoy! Okay, so, um, the last time we were together, uh, the Mythic Six went to investigate the Jim Cutters Hall and all the various people over there and sort of continued their line of questioning, trying to figure out who worked with Kyanite. Um, and eventually you sort of followed the trail and ended up at um, Kendrin's Fine Works. And it was there that you found Jelfi the Goblin, um, who had struck up some sort of bizarre deal with um, some devils that were staying in her basement. Um, you fought and were victorious. Um, you defeated the... Um, you, like, killed one of... No, didn't kill both? Maybe you killed both. You killed both. You didn't kill Jelfie. You left her to be questioned. Maybe you did turn one over. Regardless, that whole thing kind of got resolved. Um, and, and, um, you got your reward from the governor and all of that stuff. And you were headed over to Orion's to sort of check in with him and Konari, and that's kind of where we left off. So before the party made it back to Orion's, they wanted to sort of check out the shops in town, and ended up stopping at the sort of blacksmith here in Ebenmire. Um, so you sort of make your way through the town, and eventually you get to this, um, um kind of rustic um, stone establishment, um, and on, uh, across the front it has, um, this sign, um, that's sort of hanging a little bit, uh, at an angle, and across it it says the Tilted Anvil. Um, you sort of make your way inside, there's sort of a gruff, um, um, human, um, dark skin, sort of salt and peppery hair with a bushy beard that's gray. What can I do you for? Teophilia ends up deciding to have one of her weapons silvered. Um, she doesn't exactly haggle the price down like she would hope, but she does pay the amount and leaves it to be silvered. So y'all head back over to um, Orion's. You make your way back to Orion's home and um, his um, sort of maid attendant Astrid greets you and and takes you back into the cozy living room. Uh, you see Orthok leaning against the wall with his arms crossed as Konari takes a long sip of his tea and leans back in his chair. Orion walks over and, and pats him on the back. Ash, ah, so good to see you again. Sounds like you've been busy around town. Word travels fast. Well, I'm, I'm sure that the city is in, in debt to you. It sounds like you're, you and your group uh, have been quite helpful to a number of people. Yeah, and he just sort of shows y'all into the room and um, offers you tea or, or whatever. And y'all are welcome to ask whatever questions, talk to whoever. The party decides to talk to Konari and ask him if he's remembered anything. Um, so, two things. Um, one, um, I, I found this on my person, and he pulls out a pendant of a jade star in a purple circle. Um, this, this is the symbol of the jade enclave. They value their secrecy, so that's 
why the symbol isn't exactly public knowledge, but this is their symbol. Second thing, um, I, I remember the train, all of it, and uh, it's, um, it's not great, um, but, uh, and, and he, he really looks, um, sort of, um, like he's struggling with, with some of this. So, I was the one that, um, took out those two guards that first night. I'm... I'm a murderer, Ten. I don't know what to say. Um... It's... it's... not fun to remember some things. Um, and, and most of you, um, you all kind of noticed that, um... Orthok is not, like, really enjoying this, uh, conversation. He looks kind of mad and kind of frustrated in the corner. Um, Orthok kind of, he, he sort of grabs you, Karak, and sort of pulls him aside. Um, listen, I, I'm just having a hard time with all of this. Um, each time, Orion here works on him. He remembers another friend or colleague that he's killed. Consciously done or not, he killed them. And I I think I'm just having some trouble being sympathetic towards a murderer. And and based on this the scrambled state they left his brain in, it's I just don't know if he's ever gonna remember something truly crucial to everything else, the, the truth behind everything, who's pulling the strings, I just... I understand that this is good for him right now, but I... I feel like eventually he will need to be moved to a cell at the headquarters. It's at this point that the Mythic Six voices their suspicions that the queen or empress of Amarine might be more involved in this sinister plot than anybody initially realized. Really? All the way to the top? That's a pretty big, uh, it's a big claim. I mean, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but, um, still, do you think we can get evidence to support that? And this leads to the Mythic Six coming clean with Orthak about them finding the White Temple and some of their involvement with that first orb. This is, this is really, I, I need to, I need to talk to Quest, I need to talk to Molten, um, I mean, we, we, I'm not gonna lie, we, kind of knew that they had it, but we we were unsure exactly of, of what happened to, to that first team. We know the second group had a run-in with your green friend, but um but the the other group we we didn't know what happened to them. But she does have it. Um uh, we, you and me, we will talk about this more later. I, I need to go, I, I need to go report this. Um, s stay here with him. Uh, I'll be back. I'll, I'll be right back. And it appears that Konari remembered something else that's quite important. Uh, so you go sit back next to... Konarian. Um, so I remembered some other things, and, um, since I'm facing, uh, a possible prison sentence, I thought I'd just tell you guys first. Um, I, I have two names. The Green Cloaked Man, and the 
one that leads the Jade Enclave. Uh, the Green Cloaked Man is an individual named Yondar Stilton. I wish I could tell you what he, what he looks like, but uh, he he's used he's used disguised self so many times I can think of countless faces to associate with that name. I, I couldn't begin to think of which one is correct. And then the one in charge, the one that specializes in rewriting memories is an individual by the name of Azariah Fay Dark. She's the one that kind of specializes in it. Yondar sort of helps, but it's not his area of expertise. I I wish I had more, but you have names, and, and it's got to be helpful in some way, maybe. Um, they're... <laughs> these are really bad people. Um, and, uh... <laughs> I, uh, um, I hope you never run across them. I don't know, maybe you can do something with this. Uh, I can tell you that they have used me in the past to help scry. And so be careful. Um, just, I mean, who knows who's watching and when. Having received this vital information, um, a portion of the party decides to head over to Oops um, to deliver this news to them and maybe talk about what to do next. Um, so, um, Teo and, and Ash, you guys head to Oops with possibly Elzaris, Amor, Chadriel with you. Who knows? And and y'all head that way. Um, and um, once again, walk up to um, the sort of very impressive, almost sort of like marble um, building with these impressive columns, this big, shining, um, finely polished statue of this dragon out front. And you um, head up the steps and, and into um, the headquarters. Uh, you can see, uh, Orthok is literally, like, walking out as y'all come in. <laughs> and, um, sort of says hi, and then sort of heads back in the direction that y'all came from. And you can see, um, Molten Everthar, uh, Captain Molten Everthar, the sort of drow male, um, and, um, Quest, um, are sort of deep in a conversation. Um, sort of look up and uh, ah yes um good to see you again um we we just had some some news uh and uh, uh we appreciate um you being forthcoming um can, can we help you um they share the names that they got from konari but question the usefulness of such a small piece of information Still, names are helpful. Um, if we can get an agent into some place that would have records, we could we could possibly find more information. So that's that that is helpful. Thank you. Having given the order the information that they have found, they then start to ask some questions of their own and seek out some answers that are long overdue. Um, so they ask Molten about the orbs of Dragonkind. Ah, yes. The elephant in the room, is it not? Um, just sort of looks around and says, I think we should probably... Let's go somewhere a bit more private. And sort of leads y'all back into, um, sort of the back room. That's, um, looks like a private study. Um, floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, um, 
comfortable rugs and and tables with all these sorts of books strewn about. Um, so there are some things that that are still unknown, but what we do know is these these orbs are called orbs of dragon kind. Um, there are five of them, with the five chromatic orbs that make up two mats, five heads. Um, white, blue, black, red, and green. Um, each orb possesses some sort of magic. Um, it can grant the wielder abilities, but it can also tamper with your mind or harm you in some way. Um, it, it can be um, for the weak of, of mind or unlucky, it can be um, pretty devastating. You did study the blue one before um, before we transported it, and um, as far as we could tell, um, it um, it had some magical abilities, um, some sort of lightning um, magic connected to it, um, but it would deafen you if you got too far away from from it. Um, and, and could, um, give you psychic damage as well. Um, so we think that's, um, a little troubling, but I, I do believe each one is unique. Um, as far as we can tell, there seems to be, um, some sort of essence or soul tied to it. Um, that name that it would sort of whisper to you. Um, you believe is the name of possibly an ancient dragon or, or elder being, um, something that whose essence has been tied to this orb. Um, and there's something about them that, I mean, when you truly study the orb itself, it, it predates anything that we know of in, in our timeline. I mean, it, it, it seems like whatever it's made of either comes from somewhere else entirely or, or came from or was created before the Great Collapse even happened. Um, which I didn't think was possible. I mean, we didn't think anything survived that. We're, we don't even have people that know what life was like before then. Um, so all of that is is strange, but we theorized that if they are joined together, it, it could be devastating. I mean, we've done a lot of investigating at uh, the remains of the Blue Temple, um, and they seemed to think that uniting them and performing some sort of ritual could either channel Tiamat or summon her or free her in some way. I'm not entirely sure. And I mean, you know, they're cultists, so we don't exactly know the extent of their knowledge and if that truly is possible. It just seems to be what they were working towards. After this, the Mythic Six shows Captain Molten Everthar the Black Tome and hopefully get some insight on what it means and where it's pointing to. You only hand over the Black Tome. Got it. Got it. So he sort of he sort of combs through this and he's like, I mean, this is fascinating for me to get my hands on this. I never thought, never thought I'd see this. This is fantastic. Family line, you say? Interesting, interesting. Power that gnaws away to wound, gnaws away. 
very troubling. I don't know if it's like necrotic or something else. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to study this. Finding it in the midst of the wall of tracks, a lot of artifacts and and things thought lost were, were uncovered during the war, partially because there were um, these constructs used in fighting that sort of drilled under the earth and sort of unearthed a lot of a lot of things that we thought um, were gone. So that makes sense. Um, Gosh, I, I wish um, I wish we knew where exactly um, your grandmother uncovered this. I feel like that could help tremendously. Um, I mean, Swampy Maya. I mean, Morrigan has loads of swamps, but that doesn't exactly narrow it down. Then again, you could find a swamp in Amarine as well. So, um, I'm not sure. This one is a, a bit of a tricky one. I'm a bit perturbed about whatever power seems to be attached to this one. Now, if... Now, the blue one had some sort of lightning stuff attached to it, and, and that seemed to very much coincide with blue dragons. Uh, they're known for their lightning abilities. We can only assume that the white one probably dealt with cold in some way, I, I'm sure. Um, now black dragons, um, they're known for their acidic um, powers, um, which could track with this gnawing away business. I mean, few things gnaw things away better than pure acid. I do think this first line Onyx corrodes the mortal light like the flash that falls tonight. I, I, I think that one would take further study. I'm not entirely sure that that one would be off the top of my head. It doesn't seem to describe where it is, um, so it might be something different. I love, I love watching you guys theory craft. It's fantastic. You know, this is kind of in-game-ish. It's like y'all are trying to collect the Infinity Stones. <laughs> Except these Infinity Stones, like, bring Thanos to you. <laughs> Everthar did also go on to explain some of the effects of the blue orb in greater detail. Uh, it was sort of like a thunderous... Uh, as far as it was described to me, um, the person in the tomb would experience this sort of thunderous boom, but only they could hear it. Um, and that was if they got too far away from the orb. It, these orbs want you to be connected to them. They, they want a wielder. They are cursed, really, and um, and when you try to distance yourself, it is a process um, and they will not let you go easily. Um, and they also, like, grow in size when you attune to them, which is um, interesting as well. Um, they almost double in size. Then Molten explains how the Jade Enclave found out about the train, and gives the Mythic Six a bit of a warning um, in regards to who they're dealing with. I mean, they could very well have scribed on, on you to, to know that you were in possession of the... or have found the orb. Um, we have also found out that there is a guard, um, a guard working um, in Axrath that seemed very disgruntled about your group's um, presence, involvement, um, I think particularly aimed at um, uh, the Miss Elzaris, and it seems like he let some, let some information slip that, that he should not have, um, which might be part of how they knew 
when they were transporting it and, and how that whole thing went awry. Um, don't worry, we will squeeze in these consequences. But um, it seems like the people we're dealing with are very intelligent. Um, they seem to specialize in finding information um, and using whatever means to do so. And after the people we lost at the White Temple and, and after that at the market, um, it's, it's going to be challenging. Ultimately, we just want to collect these things to hopefully destroy them, um, if we can. Um, that might be a difficult process. But your, your help is appreciated, and um, the information is, is useful. At this point, uh, there's like a knock on the door, and uh, like a, a guard sticks her head in. Um, Captain Morton, we are all... Oh. If you could just come with us, we just need to finish up the questioning, uh, if we're done here, and, and he sort of looks like, ah, yes, of course, questioning the rest of the, uh, the, uh, train, um, passengers. Yes, um, if you'll excuse me, um, thank you so much about all of this, um, um, but, um, you know, everyone's welcome here at the Order, um, and, and if you can't find me here, I'm, I'm probably down the street at the uh, Church of Bahamut, so if you ever need to find me, uh, I'll be in one of those two places. I think now would be a great time to go on and take a little bit of a break. I need some coffee. Alright, so um, you finished talking to everybody at Oops. Um, you do whatever. Um, eventually, Orthoc does come back to Orion's house um, and um, just sort of chill and hanging out. Um, oh, he will say, he will say, um, so uh, I don't know if we ever fully talked about it, but um, you, you did go home not too long ago and um, just, um, I don't know, have you thought more about <laughs> becoming chief and being ready to fill that role? And then Orthok and Karak kind of have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart and talk about home and their brothers and their family situation and the responsibilities that come with that. So you're better than me. I kind of got tired of all of that and just left. Ugh. You had your own things that you were good at. You had this spiritual connection that I can't even really understand. I, I had to make my own way. And I just didn't want... If history were going to repeat itself, and even the Lincoln Racket will, I, I didn't want to be around to see it. Though, of course, if things do get bad again, if you need me, there. Yeah, eventually the rest of the group, like you all sort of arrive back at Orion's and um, it's, uh, it's late afternoon, early evening, um, days kind of come into a close. With members of the party having finally been reunited with some of their family members, they decide that they would rather stay at Orion's and stay together then go sleep on the ship and leave poor Kunari by himself. Orion looks around and he's like, Oh, are, are, are we having... Is this what they call a slumber party? Astrid! Astrid! Make some cookies! <laughs> and, and Astrid like rolls her eyes and then walks into the kitchen. The Mythic Six spend a good portion of the evening swapping stories and reminiscing about old times, and eventually they start to talk about what to do next and their wariness about going back to Amarine. Um, and they start to talk about their theory that Empress Lorelai Ysira may be involved somehow, and Kunari had a little bit to say about that. I, although, I will say, I. 
I don't remember dealing with her personally. Everything, every order either came from Yandar or Azariah. It, it just came from the two of them, so I don't know... I don't know if she knows everything that the Enclave is up to or not. I mean, she could. Um, I never dealt with her directly. Everything came from Azariah. The Mythic Six then talk about what they want to do next. Um, kind of settling on the idea of going to Romrath and then maybe to Ballyran. They also discuss possibly cashing in the favor that Lilith owes them and using that to get her to maybe spy or possibly smuggle Mortimer out of Amarine. And eventually this sort of works its way around to a conversation about Konari and what to do with him and maybe seeing if he would travel with them and, and sort of join their crew. Look, if I can at least begin to make amends for some of the stuff that I've done or been used to do, um, I think it would give me some peace of mind. Orthog sort of looks over and it's like, you, you might have to really uh, lay it on thick to um, convince convince the order to, to agree to that but good luck um, I don't know if I don't know if they go for that sort of thing I mean it's one thing to, to trust a group of people they don't really know to help them solve this seemingly world-ending issue it's 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 another thing to let a known suspect out of their sight. No offense, and Konari's like, No, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I understand. I can't say I'm eager to go running into battle, but, um, I do want to help. Before they finally go to bed for the night, the Mythic Six does send a message to Mortimer, warning him about the Jade Enclave, and tries to see if maybe he could find a way out of that audience with the Queen. Um, alright, there's there's a brief pause and then you get Oh, hello! Lots of information! <laughs> I will decipher this! Not sure I can get out of audience? I have ideas! Perhaps I should talk to Gideon about this. Maybe if I- and then it just sort of trails off. After that, the party decided to head to sleep for the night. Um, so, yeah, watches or no watches, um, you all head to sleep. And, um, K-Rock. As you drift off to sleep, you find yourself on a small boat on the water. You look out at the water's surface and two yellow eyes appear from the depths and a warm voice enters your head. Hello, my child. The last time you spoke, I warned you about dangers ahead. Now I warn you of a past that may be repeated. The surface of the water ripples and stills till it looks like a clear sheet of glass mirroring the stars. But it's not mirroring the stars. It is the stars. Your boat no longer sails in the water, but sails through the cosmos, toward a small, round planet of blue and green. Your boat zooms closer, and time seems to pass in seconds. You watch as the world shifts and changes. You watch as one half of this round planet slowly turn brown and desolate. You enter the orbit and can see fires and explosions enveloping the surface of this earth as two shapes zoom through the sky, circling and twisting around each other as if locked in some deadly dance. One of the blurs breaks away and sends another inferno raining down onto the planet below. 
Your boat speeds through the atmosphere and down to the surface. You pass landscapes and cities in an instant, each wrought with devastation. Suddenly your boat comes to a stop. You look up and see an enormous ball of fire descending towards the earth with certain doom to follow. You hear cries and wails erupt from every corner of every city, and it feels as if the ground itself is splitting in two. Then a chorus of voices shout in unison, Enough! A flash of white light washes over you, silencing all the screams in an instant and obscuring your sight. Suddenly, you and your boat are thrust back into the cosmos, and as your eyes adjust, your vision returns, and you see before you not the round planet raised in ashen, but the two familiar halves of Aurelia, bound by the bright, iridescent crystal floating at its center. The Wild Mother's voice enters your head once more. This is your past, and will be your future should you fail. The brother will help you, as he has done so before. And you wake up. Eventually you hear a pounding on the door, and um, Astrid goes and answers it. Eventually, um, an order of the Platinum Shield Guard um, rushes in and motions for Orthox to come over, um, and the two sort of break off into some sort of hushed discussion. Um, uh, you catch a couple words um, every once in a while. Um, you hear um, you hear something about some sort of incident happening in the city. Um, they mention the Moon Shadow Express at one point. Seem to be asking for um, Poor Park to go help. Um, and eventually he breaks away and he's like, um, there is, there's something going on and, um, I, I, I've got to head that way. I've, I've got to go, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's probably fine. It's, it's probably nothing. Um, I, uh, um, I, we just, I, we need to go. We need to just. We just gotta check it out. And, um, he rushes up. It's, like, really early. But I'll give you your long rest, but, um, it's still dark outside. Um, before you head out, Konori is just gonna, um, just, just be careful. Um, not wanting to be separated from her brother, Tanari decides to stay behind with Konari, and Ash does the same. The rest of the party rushes off to chase after Orthok. Um, so, y'all rush down uh, the, the streets, and um, there is a commotion happening. Um, and you look and you see ahead of you in the middle of the street, there's a couple, um, well, there's there's about five Order of the Platinum Shield, um, guards or soldiers um though like there are three with a figure behind them that are facing the other two that are trying to like argue and um reason with them they seem it's like the order of the platinum shield members are having a dispute and as you get closer you can see the figure in the back and you recognize it as escher and um he is like in a tizzy he's got this these three guards in front of him that um seem to be listening to him and just sort of doing everything that he's telling them to do um and he's like i will not be a prisoner i am not going to stay here it is too hot and dry and you people have terrible taste lord zarovich had better taste than you i am leaving I am going away, and you cannot keep me here. One of the order uh, members is like, this guy, this pastor, I've never, he just, 
and they wanted to take him back for further questioning and he lost it and um well he's apparently a vampire and uh he is controlling these other three guys and we just can't seem to talk him down escher escher is like you are not taking me anywhere i am leaving and that is final escher um looks at you and looks at the rest of the the group that's here and he's like I think I've had enough questions, don't don't you think? And um he snaps his fingers and um the guards under his control need to attack and we are going to stop there for tonight. We pick up with that next week. Alright, Misfits, and that brings us to the end of tonight's game. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you again next time.